In today's episode, I welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Michael Moss. Michael Moss is the author of two New York Times bestselling books on the processed food industry, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, and Hooked. He's a frequent guest of newscasts from the CBS This Morning to the BBC, and he spent his career as an investigative reporter with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. In today's episode, we're going to pull back the curtain on big business of food and understand how the chemists are making you hooked on processed foods. Let's welcome Michael Moss to the show. Michael Moss, I'm so excited to have you on the show. I think that the books that you've written and just your reporting on what's happening in our food system is so critically important, not only for all of us, but especially for parents with young kids who can be derailed by the dopamine explosion in their brains from these highly processed and palatable foods. So thank you so much for being here and donating your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Thank you for your work. And and just one caveat, I had kids when I was doing the early part of the reporting for this, but the youngest just went off to college and the oldest has finished college and is now working. So I think of them now as young adults as opposed to kids. But um, but yeah, totally. We could talk about those younger years, especially and, w- and what a challenge it is for for your listeners, for everybody. Well, for those of you, I mean, I feel like most people will will know your work, but if they don't, you wrote the New York Times bestselling book, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, and you wrote another book in 2021, Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How the Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions. So if you're just tuning in, this is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. But before you started down this passion project to, to really expose the food industry and understand the, um, you know, the chemical engineering of our highly processed foods, you were reporting on American health detainees in Iraq and the lack of protective armor for our soldiers there. What, like, how did you get that start and what, what made you pivot into food? Yeah. So I, I I worked for the, the investigations group of the New York times. Um, and back at nine 11, I was actually spending a year looking at mammograms and radiologists who were not reading them correctly and missing and missing cancers when 9-11 happened and it kind of turned us all into national security reporters and eventually it went to Iraq to torture the Pentagon for failing to equip soldiers with just basic armor because the Pentagon's more interested in billion dollar aircraft carriers than they are on poor and middle-class kids who were going to fight that war. And I was continuing to kind of write about the war on terrorism kind of critically when I got in some trouble in Algeria and had to come home. And my editor at the New York Times had spotted this outbreak of salmonella in peanuts being manufactured down on the Alabama-Georgia border. And she goes, you know, Michael, this could be A, a lot safer for you and B, really, really interesting because these peanuts are being used as ingredients in thousands of products by this trillion dollar food industry that we really kind of know very little about. So I went down, took a look, did some reporting. That led to the reporting that I did on E. coli in hamburgers, which won the Pulitzer Prize just because I was incredibly lucky to come across a trove of internal documents that allowed me kind of to dig into the food chain. And, And it was kind of a story about this industry kind of losing control over its ingredients, sometimes intentionally, in order to avoid costly recalls. But I was continuing to write about food safety, right? Pathogens, bugs in our food. When one of my best sources who tests meat for E. coli said, you know, Michael, as tragic as these incidents of contamination are, you should really look at what my industry is intentionally adding to its products. He was worried about all the salt, going into processed meat, that led me to look at fats and sugars as this unholy trinity on which this industry relies on to get us to not just like their products, but to but to want more and more. And again, I was incredibly lucky to come across a trove of documents that put me inside the largest of these 10 or 12, you know, multinational food companies as they're as they're formulating and engineering and marketing and positioning their products. And it was those documents, emails and white papers and strategy papers 
that allowed me to identify key sources in the industry to open up and reveal even more secrets. And that, in essence, was the, the substance of the of the first book I wrote, Soul Cheer of God. Well, I definitely want our audience to go back and read it because it stands the test of time and it, we're seeing all of all of that still happening in today's food system. So when you look back on the treasure trove of documents and white papers, what were some of the key aha moments that came out for you that you maybe didn't understand were happening as a consumer of these foods? Yeah, there, there, there's some basic elements that these companies are using to get us to love and fall for their products. Some of it's extraordinary science, right? And I, and I have to love, even though I'm a reporter trained to follow the money, I kind of fell in love with the language that they use to describe their efforts to maximize the allure of their products, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the term, the bliss point. Well, I <laughs> met Howard Moskowitz, an, I, you know, a legend in the industry, responsible for many of the biggest icons in the grocery store. He, he showed me how he, in fact, he coined the term, the bliss point, to describe the perfect amount of sweetness in foods, not too little, not too much. And he walked me through a recent project he did for Dr. Pepper where he started with no less than 60 versions of sweetness, subjected that to 3,000 consumer taste tests around the country, did his you know, high aggression math analysis thing with the data. And out came these bell-shaped charts that kind of look like you know kids get graded on at school, except at the top of the, of the, of the bell-shaped curve is not the dreaded middle C, it was the perfect amount of sweetness. Mm -hmm. and. What Howard sort of showed me, though, because when you talk to nutritionists, the problem from their, their, their standpoint isn't that this industry engineers bliss points for things like cookies and ice cream and soda, things we know, you know are sweet and we're naturally worried of. They marched around the grocery store adding sugar, engineering bliss points to things that didn't used to be sweet. So bread came to have added sugar and a bliss point for sweetness. Some yogurts came to have as much sugar per serving as ice cream. Spaghetti sauce aisle, oh my God. I mean, there were some brands that had the equivalent of a couple of Oreo cookies with a sweetness in a tiny half cup serving. And so what that did arguably is taught us to expect everything we eat to be sweet. So when you go to the produce aisle or, you know, God help you drag your kids over there, and try to talk them into eating, you know, into eating something with some of those other basic tastes that Aristotle wrote about way back when, right? Bitter, sour, you know, you're going to get a rebellion on your hands and your kids are going to be dragging you back to the 90% of the store that has these sugar added products. So that was a bliss point. They kind of did the same things for salt. They mm -hmm. call it the flavor burst. It's typically the first thing that touches your tongue when you eat like a potato chip mm -hmm. sends a signal to the reward center of the brain, just like sugar, um, that lights up and says, wow, Michael, I love that. Let's have more of that. And then fats, right? Often it's palm oil that they're adding to these products. Mm -hmm. they, they, they describe that as, as being the mouthfeel. It's that, it's that sensation of biting into a warm toasted cheese sandwich. And you could probably tell I'm more yeah. of a kind of a salt fat guy than sweet because my <laughs> brain is lighting up. Just kind yeah. of thinking about that, right? But it's kind of a, and then they came up with combinations of those two. And, and one of the kind of most devious aspects of convenience processed foods that causes us to lose control is that the combination of sugar and fats in their products seems to, there's some evidence, seem to, to sort of settle in a part of the brain where <laughs> habit forms and excite that part of the brain. And when you think about it, there's almost nuts, nothing in nature that has that combination of fat and sweet, but that really characterizes much of what's in the grocery store and in you know, fast food restaurants. Oh, I mean, just knowing that there is a science behind habit, knowing just on taste alone is a little jarring. And then I will say like, I've seen it happen so quickly you know, I love Whole Foods. I'm a nutritionist by trade. I work with clients all the time to put Whole Foods on their plate, all the, you know, a mix of macronutrients. But I'll give you an example. There's a new bakery that 
popped up in town. It's slow, triple fermented sourdough bread. And they did this thing around Thanksgiving where they were making croissants. So it's like, great. I had a dentist appointment. I'm like, okay, I'll, I will never really buy these baked goods for my family, but it's like this, you know, artisanal bakery in our town. And I'm like, all right, I'll get a couple of those. And I had one on the way home. And it was so weird because six months later, I went to the dentist, had another cleaning, and it, I thought about that croissant on the Ew. way home. Isn't that weird that it like immediately triggered this food memory that I don't think I would have ever had for fruits or veggies or, you know, just like that, yeah. that nostalgia for that specific food yeah. in that exact order it was so yeah, weird. Yeah. I like I had that moment like, whoa. You know, because we're not I totally. Get I totally <laughs> get that, right? So, memory is actually one of the one of the most powerful tools. And so, for the second book, I started sort of asking because, you know, Salt Sugar Fat came out. More and more people were caring about what they're putting in their bodies. The companies were responding by going, you know, okay, we're going to cut back on Salt Sugar Fat, and yet, you know, our trouble with their products, you know, you know, arguably only deepened. And so, I started asking, like what else is it about these products that makes them so powerful? And mm -hmm. one of the things is food memories, right? These companies spend a lot of time thinking about ways to get in our heads when we we're kids. And that's why Coca-Cola and Pepsi spend so much effort trying to get pouring rights at ball stadiums, at sports events, right? Because they know when we take our kids to those events and they have a soda for the first time in their life, that soda gets associated with that joyous moment and it'll stick in your brain associating with joy and comfort and family for the rest of your life. So dial forward 40 years, you're having a stressful day, your brain will connect that back to the soda. I mean, I grew up as a latchkey kid, California, come home, elementary school, my mom worked outside of the home, so I let myself in. My favorite go-to, Strawberry Pop-Tarts, right? Oh, yeah. I hadn't had a Pop-Tart, you know, in 40 years until this one day I went to the Kellogg's Research and Development Facility in, in Battle Creek, Michigan. I was actually there doing some digging and, and reporting on something entirely different, but they were experimenting with a batch of Pop-Tarts that had messed up and they were dumping this vast amount of Pop-Tart dough into this bin. And the aroma wafted across the factory floor, entered that little part of my brain <laughs> that triggered instantly took me back to those latchkey kid moments, right? Because, and the important, uh, the important thing to remember this is that the Pop-Tart never left my brain. Yeah. Right? I hadn't eaten one in 40 years, but it was still in my head. And what the industry does to kind of kindle those memories, it's called advertising. Psychologists right. call those things cues. They call it advertising, marketing. You know, there are kids who all they have to do is look at the Coca-Cola brand and their brains are going to light up for a soda and they're going to desire that. So memory is absolutely huge when we think about what makes us vulnerable to, to overeating these products. Definitely. You know, one of the things that stood out for me um, in your book was that not only is it memory, but you talk about how these foods completely dissolve in our mouths. And it's, yeah. you know, I, I'm i a big proponent of the stretching of your stomach and the regulation of hunger hormones through specific macronutrients like protein and and fibers and things like that. And so... I would love for you to explain how these foods really, I guess, don't have the satiety backing that a whole food that is loaded with, you know, those essential amino acids, essential fatty acids may have. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, so so um, there's a couple of things kind of going on. And one of the aspects of that goes back to the term, the mouthfeel, right? Mm -hmm. So mouthfeel is a beautiful thing for the industry because it basically allows their products to to kind of melt and dissolve in your mouth you can you can do this 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 hunting for yourself just look at the label of a product and typically on a fast food a processed food product in the grocery store 
50%, half of the calories will be coming from the oil in their product. And they try to hit that formula because that means that typically that thing you put in your mouth that has that perfect formula is going to melt in your mouth. That's kind of one of the characteristics of these foods. You don't really need to chew them very much. And to take a real obvious example, a cheese puff, put mm -hmm. it in your mouth, you know, press your tongue against the roof of the mouth without any chewing at all, it's going to dissolve. Mm -hmm. And what they discovered, going back to this language they use about allure, they discovered that when that happens, right, it sends a signal to the brain that not only did the cheese puff sort of melt, but the calories disappeared. And the brain says, hey, Michael, you might as well keep eating because obviously we didn't get anything from that cheese puff, right? And yeah. so the industry has a term for that. It's called the vanishing caloric density, <clears throat> right? To describe those disappearing calories when they get their products through that perfect 50% formula. But the calories thing raises is a really, really interesting and important point. So in the course of kind of reporting the, the most recent book, Hook, that I did, I spent time with um, biologists who, who love evolution. And this works for people even who believe in creationism, because you really only have to go back seven or 8,000 years when we lived in hunter-gatherer societies. And, and what they have done very cleverly is kind of look at all the things, all the ways that we adapted to our food environment that, that in, in, in that time that, that would attract us to food. And so one of the things we love about food instinctually as a deep instinct is cheapness. Because mm -hmm. cheapness meant less energy expenditure in our part. So it was a difference between spending all day trying to run an antelope down for dinner or just reaching down and grabbing that poor aardvark there, right? Mm -hmm. You're in a hunter-gatherer society. You're going to minimize energy expenditure, grab that aardvark. So what are the food companies done knowing that? They have people working for them, chemists in laboratory called, laboratories called flavor labs, where they mix and match the chemicals to mimic the real flavors of foods. But their overarching mission for the processed food industry is to reduce the price, the cost of production, because they know if they can knock 15 cents off the price of a box of Pop-Tarts, the next yeah. time you walk in the store, you're going to instinctually get excited by that in a way that you don't even kind of recognize. We, by nature, are drawn to food that's highly variable, right? It kind of made sense back in those hunter-gatherer societies because you wanted to eat a little bit of lots of stuff, so you made sure you got all the nutrition you needed. And it was, it was why humans were able to spread around the globe and live in the Arctic and fall in love with whale blubber if that's all you had to eat. We love variety. And so what did the industry do? They created the cereal aisle where there's okay. this pretense a variety in 200 brands of sugary starch, knowing that we will, again, instinctually get excited about that. But getting back to the calories, so one of the ways that we're hardwired to be attracted to food is through calories. Um, we have sensors on our tongue, possibly in the gut, that actually tell us how many calories there are in the food that we're eating. Because for most of our existence, getting calories was a really good thing. You wanted mm -hmm. more. It was a matter of life and death. Putting on body fat was a really good thing because you were going to burn that off with the next famine, drought, or ice age, right? Mm -hmm. But in the last 50 years, what has this industry done? Knowing how we're instinctually attracted to calories, they started creating these highly caloric, nutritionally empty products, right? Mm -hmm. That would excite our tongues, right? The calorie detectors, the rest of our body. Knowing though, and here's the problem, is that this has happened just in the last 50 years. So our biology hasn't been able to catch up. We're in this huge mismatch between our biology and the food environment. And we can't tell instinctually the difference between a junk calorie and a wholesome calorie. And so those are three really critical ways that the industry is not only kind of using these magic ingredients like salt, sugar, fat, but they're exploiting our own biology to attract us to these, to these, to these food products, which in many cases aren't even really food. Right, right. And you just see uh, a massive amount of 
sugar and fat and salt, com that combination just exploding in our brain. I don't know about you, but when I think about, I was a Costco kid. I always say like my parents shopped at Costco. I had free reign to do and eat whatever I wanted in the cabinets. And, you know, for me, it was frosted flakes, you know, the tiger frosted flakes, Kellogg's like, and I remember being in like fifth or sixth grade and having a bowl and then having another bowl. Like there was no off button for it. It's sort of the Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop kind of mentality where in any other type of food situation, sitting down to eggs and avocado, a scramble, you know, um, something of substantial nutrient density, even with those calories, there's an off button. There's a natural off switch that happens. It just doesn't happen with these processed foods. Now, in your in your research and reporting, looking at these food companies and then looking at the you know government policies to sort of like, where's the adult in the room? Like who who and how are we going to have change in the industry when obviously these are big businesses, there are stockholders, there are boards, there are people who, like you said, not only are we responding to a fifteen cent discount in our pop tarts, that company no. is seeing a massive increase in sales to their bottom line. Like what, how, how do you see the industry changing? Um, yeah. Or no. yeah. No, it's a really, it's, it's a great behemoth. question. I was, yeah, no, no, no. So I, I was thinking about this the other day and talking to somebody and, and, and salt trigger fat opens with this secret meeting, yeah. 1999, the heads of the biggest companies get together in secret to talk about none other than their culpability in the growing obesity, diabetes, gout, et cetera, problem mm -hmm. caused by their food products, right? It's an incredible meeting. And, and they're brought there by a cabal of insiders who are growing alarmed about their culpability. Mm -hmm. They want the industry to turn around and change. Mm -hmm. They don't, of course. I mean, you can, you know, you can read about it. But, but what's really kind of interesting to think about is like, if we could go back, and kind of slip into that meeting back in 1990. Who else would we want in that room to kind of help persuade those CEOs to change their ways? And I think one of the people you want in there is somebody with a big stick, because mm -hmm. they're not going to change otherwise. Mm -hmm. It could be a regulator, but I'm thinking more, it's like one of these very clever attorneys who went after big tobacco in very clever ways. Mm -hmm. and they could sort of be there just holding the stick saying, we're going to come after you and hold you responsible for the billions and billions of dollars in healthcare expenses that you're causing <clears throat> because of your products. And we now know there's hard science on that. So you'd want that big stick there. I think you'd want some really inventive and smart insiders within the processed food industry who have switched sides and there are these people they've quit in disgust and now mm -hmm. they're now helping sort of startup companies try to design products that are cheap and convenient and variable and yummy but also won't kill you 10 years down the road right that are actually right. healthy but then because of the huge financial pressure on these companies to keep their stock price going up I think you need somebody from Wall Street. Um, and Tristan Harris of, of Social Dilemma, I was just chatting with him. He was, he was suggesting maybe what we need is like a separate stock exchange for companies that are wanting to change, but they need time, right? Yeah. They need time to help us change our eating habits and they need time to develop the products um, where they're not under such intense pressure from from brokers and, and financiers to, to have immediate financial results. So those are kind of three institutional things that I think I'd want to see happen for there to be really, truly um, meaningful change within the industry. Right. And it's so interesting when you talk about like the insiders or the people who have for, sort of flip-flopped. I can, I can only imagine seeing behind the velvet, you know, rope or behind the curtain of these big businesses, what they're seeing, you know, what they're seeing their chemists do, what they understand as like the bliss point or the flavor burst and how that can derail their own eating habits. Like I highly doubt the majority of them are even eating their own food. Oh, you stole my punchline. When people ask me what the most surprising thing I learned is on a, on a, on a personal level, 
it's that they do not eat their own foods. They know better. Well, either yeah. they don't have to because yeah. they make so much money they can hire personal chefs yeah. and you know trainers and all of that. Or two, they know better. They themselves. Well, I was chatting not long ago with the former general counsel for Philip Morris, the top lawyer, big tobacco company, because as I wrote in Salt Sugar Fat, for years and years, Philip Morris was the single largest manufacturer of processed food in North yeah. America. Most people don't know that. They owned Kraft, General Foods, Nabisco. Anyway, he goes, you know, Michael, I was one of those people who could smoke one cigarette a day, put the pack away, not think about it until like the next business meeting, the next day. But I couldn't go near a bag of our Oreo cookies, right? Um, they mm -hmm. owned it at the time. For fear of losing control and eating half of that giant bag in one sitting. So even they know how powerful their, their products are. And as a way of dealing with that, you know, their strategy is to just keep them out of the house. Don't go near them. Right. Which is kind of ironic, too, because one of the, one of the playbooks of this industry, and it's true of other big industries that create products that are causing us trouble, whether it's big oil or painkillers, tobacco, is that they want to blame us. They yeah. want to shift the blame to us. They want us to think it's our fault that we have suddenly somehow just lost all of our free will and determination, which is ridiculous on its face. So that would just like to happen over it. <laughs> and one of the ways that the food industry has done that is literally taken control of the dieting industry. And I spent a whole sort of chapter in the last book looking at that because I was totally shocked to find out that none other than Heinz, which is now Kraft Heinz, the maker of high fructose corn syrup, you know, uh, tomato sauce and ketchup mm -hmm. and, and unlimited varieties of, you know, frozen French fries that could turn your kitchen into a drive-in. They purchased and ran none other than Weight Watchers for years and years, knowing, you know, that the success rate of Weight Watchers and helping people lose weight isn't anywhere near what people hope when they when they go into it. And again, sort of part of this playbook of making us feel like it's our fault in order to blame, you know, avoid responsibility and, and blame for themselves. And I think that's the biggest takeaway I want people to have from my work is that it's not your fault. Yeah. These products are engineered in a way that destroys your free will, your ability to sort of control them. Oh, it's informed consent, which until, you know, books like yours, people don't really understand and they think they have zero control, self, you know, self-discipline. Self you look at something like Weight Watchers, for example, with points, it's like they're going to assign a point to anything and everything you want to eat without understanding the implications of that hijacking of that dopamine pathway in the brain or that, you know, the vanishing calories, like of not feeling pure satiety from that and not putting weight on that with their points. You know, it's, it's really unfortunate because like you said, like we're, we're just, we haven't caught up. Like if it, if we're getting calories from cheese puffs or we're getting calories from chicken and veggies, it's, it, our brain isn't able to tell the difference. And I, I love that about your work because, the, you know, especially being in the nutrition space, it's something that I recognize. Like I grew up in Cal Southern California. Like I said, a Costco kid. I had access to all the big um, business foods from Triscuits, Wheat Thins, Oreos, Animal Cookies, Pop-Tarts, like the cereals, you name it. It's very much a part of my youth. And there is this expectation for people when they want to be healthy that they should be able to have these around for themselves or their kids to have occasionally when they want a small serving. Yeah. What is your advice knowing what you've seen kind of behind the scenes for parents and for people who, you know, want to lead a healthier lifestyle when it comes to engaging in, in or eating these types of foods? Like, yeah. Yeah, so, so with the with the last book, I was looking at that question: is is this are these things so powerful we should think of them as being addictive products, you know, like tobacco or alcohol mm -hmm. or even some drugs? And at first, I thought that was totally crazy. I mean, you're you're telling me a Twinkie is like fentanyl? I mean, this is, yeah. it didn't make sense. But I have to say, I came full circle on that question. In some ways, 
I think these products are even more powerful and make us more vulnerable than, than tobacco and, and alcohol. But one of the interesting aspects of that exercise I did was then looking at the question, well, what lessons can we draw from the world of other addictive substances that might help us cope with this, these products and this food environment? Mm-hmm. And I think what's interesting to think about is that you know, addiction happens on a scale, on a spectrum. Mm-hmm. And for somebody who's like at one end of the spectrum, who just cannot resist a bag of Oreos without eating half the thing, I think the lesson from the world of other addictions is to practice abstinence. It's, it's mm-hmm. do everything you can to keep that product out of the house and mm-hmm. away from you, right? I mean, for you, that's like an alcoholic walking into a bar looking for a glass of water. It's just not going to work, right? Mm-hmm. So that's at one end of the spectrum. A lot of us kind of fall prey to these products in the middle of the day, 3 mm-hmm. p.m. You get a craving for whatever your trigger food is, and it could be salt and fat for me, sugar for somebody else, right? And I think the strategy you get from the world of other addictions is that these cravings you get happen so fast and trigger kind of the primitive part of your brain that says, go, run, grab it, right? That the thinking part of your brain up here in the frontal cortex doesn't have time to catch up. And so the strategy that, that other people use under the situation is to get ahead of that craving. And so if it's 3 p.m. craving that comes on, you need to be executing whatever strategy works for you at like 245, whether mm-hmm. it's like walking around the block or calling somebody on the phone or eating like a handful of nuts, you know, that maybe can satisfy you and fill you up until, until dinner time. That has to be happening before that craving comes on. And then I think, you know, for the rest of us who, who don't sort of have that kind of overall many craving for something, but the problem with the trouble with food for them is just kind of missing the love and the beauty of home cooked meals with family and friends. <laughs> Sorry. The, the solution probably is in the realm of, you know, dealing with one of the, you know, turning the tables on these companies and, and dealing with what I think is one of the, the biggest characteristics of these troubles of foods, which is that they're fast. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're manufactured quickly. They're packaged in a way that we can get to quickly. They hit the brain really quickly. Um, there have been great studies, you know, by addiction researchers showing that the faster a substance hits the brain, the more apt we are to act compulsive. And so the, the way to turn the tables on that is just to slow it down, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why cooking is such a beautiful thing, right? And, y- you know, you don't spend all day slaving at the stove, right? But just, you know... The extent to which you can, and I, this is usually where I talked about my 90 second tomato sauce recipe, right? Where you've got, you know, a hunk of garlic and whatever basil you got sitting around, some olive oil, and you open a can of, you know, of, of tomatoes and throw them in and you stir it a bit. And granted, if it simmers for a while, my kids are more apt to eat it. But but the basic work going into that is, is 90 seconds. And there are so many other things you can do like that to help you reclaim and revalue how you look at food and, 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 and how you kind of deal with it. Um, so I, so I love, I love that notion of cooking as being our way to, to, to regain control of our eating habits. Um, and kids are a special thing. And, and what, what else going to mind when our kids are growing up, you know, we, we really, it was like broccoli was the thing in our house, right? We really wanted them to love broccoli and they hated broccoli, of course. But my <laughs> wife kind of came up with this rule, which was like, you know, well, we just have to get them to try it like 19 times and then they'll like it. And I don't remember how many times it actually took, but we did. And they did. And to this day, both my sons will come home and, or even where they're living now. And they continue to eat just plain steamed broccoli, you know, with that, you know, having gotten inside their heads as a memory, as a, as a good thing to remember and sort of keep them going. So that's certainly one strategy with kids is, you know, and, and we also, you know, I mean, just one other thing is that, I mean, everybody's got a different strategy on parenting. We, we try not to stay 
no as much as we said, well, let me tell you, you know, about kind of why these companies are trying to get you to say yes, right? And kids really get, I've given talks to grammar school kids. And they totally understand this in the context of these multinational companies trying to get us to do their bidding. It's like, should I listen to them or should I listen to myself? I'm a real little person here, right? Right. So communicating with kids and also trying not to say a flat out no, because they're going to run down the street to their friend's house and get all the crap that, you know, you were trying to get them to avoid. But if you could, instead of saying no, entice them into kind of some better eating strategies, I, I think that's a wonderful strategy for parents with young kids. Well, I have to say that just looking at the research, I wrote a kid's course on getting your kids to eat healthier and avoid picky eating and introducing foods in a fla- in the flavor window, which is the first 18 months of life. And your your wife was on to something. It's, <laughs> um, it's modeling and exposure to yeah. to those fruits and vegetables by the parents, by the caregivers. But the exposure part is really interesting. Majority of parents give up and stop offering foods to children after three to five no's. So if your kids would have said like no to broccoli three to five times and your wife threw in the towel and said, Michael, forget it. We tried our best. Hopefully when they get older, they'll eat healthy. <laughs> <laughs> they may never have come around uh, until they got into nutrition college or when they wanted to feel their best. But it is so, so important not to give up and to continue to just offer and model that because it she's exactly right. You know, it's a it's about a dozen times before, you know, 18 months. And then it doubles or triples after that when they're like young toddlers and really defiant or they're trying to assert independence. And it's it's so, so important to slow it down and just make make that food for your family um, yeah. without yeah. having things be off limits. So in looking at your kids' eating behaviors now, and you, I mean, you're giving every one of our audience members informed consent. Like you're telling them you're, what's happening in big business and why these foods have these bliss points, flavor bursts, you know, these special qualities that really make it not their fault when they can't stop eating them. When you're talking to your kids about that, um, let's say, for example, you are, you know, one of your kids play sports and they get a bag full of treats or they go to a birthday party and they're getting treats. When you're having that conversation, what are your, what are your boundaries? Like, are they able to have them in those instances? Are you still telling them what's happening? Like, how does it walk us through it? Yeah. I mean, like we had the seven day Halloween rule or maybe it was five days. Uh They could pick out all they wanted for five days and then we would throw it out. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and that's a that's an extreme example of, of that. I think, I think, again, it comes back to having this kind of continuing conversation with them, not preaching to them mm-hmm. about the harm they're doing to their bodies, but talking about, you know, why Tom Brady called soda poison, right? Mm-hmm. One of the few, you know, celebrity athletes out there who had the guts or enough money <laughs> Not to take those endorsements and be honest about that thing. But in terms of athleticism, talking about food as, as nutrition, I mean, the New York Mets just lost their closer to an injury. And the owner, who's a very rich guy, you know, did two things for him. One, he sent him his personal chef to live with him. Uh, but he also sent them a nutritionist to live mm-hmm. in his home you know, to get him to heal faster, get stronger so he could come back. So I think talking to kids about food being, okay, yeah, there's the immediate joy of eating junk food, but there's the longer term goal of making your body strong. I mean, do you want to hit more home runs? This is how you do it. You have to build your muscles and your strength. And again, I think that conversation should there i am preaching now but you know should happen like a non-preachy way because preaching we none of us like that anymore the government's been preaching us for decades to eat more vegetables and look how you know look how that has that has worked out you know there's one other thought i had which might help your your viewers i don't know but become really fascinated with the language of food because you know Food giants own the language of food. You walk in the store and there's all these advertising, the stories they tell about their junk food. Well, I think that's a really powerful way that we can turn the tables on them. 
which mm -hmm. is to develop better stories about the food, home cooked food that we're serving to them. And maybe those stories are coming from a grandparent, right? In our mm -hmm. In our ethnic sort of history, but maybe it's stories we just kind of invent, right? I mean, you know, your kid has a great, you know, evening on the in the at the ball baseball game, and he comes home. Well, maybe that simple dish you're serving for dinner suddenly has a new name to celebrate that great day on the ballpark. And I can't, you know, I can't think of it right mm -hmm. now. But all of a sudden, right? It's like it's like creating a fancy menu for your home cooked meals, all of a sudden that dish is always going to be associated then by name, um, the Tuesday night pasta dinner, whatever it is, with that great moment in the kid's life. And so now you're reclaiming the power of language to steer, help steer kids toward the, the, the beauty of, of eating well for themselves. I think that's a beautiful way and a positive way to advertise or cue our own children to be eating healthy. I think in my personal life, we, you know, we lived in an apartment in Los Angeles for a very long time. My husband and I been together since 2007. Um, and we had children, Sebastian in 2018 and Toshin in 2020. Um, and we finally moved into our own home in December of 2022. So really a backyard and a, we have a grow bed now and it, you've just inspired me. Just thinking about, you know, I, I love the exposure that they're getting to like, I mean, Sebastian goes out there, there are edible flowers and he'll pull one off and show his friends and eat one. It's really cute. Um, but just the stories around the nutrition on a deeper level, the how like explaining that the tomatoes that are growing up the trellis are what make the tomato sauce that make his pasta and really kind of showing him that good food is slow food. Yeah. And if you could save them, you know, could you, I mean, it's really hard to get kids to cook, right? Because it takes a long time. It's complicated. The other things going, but if you could engage him just a little bit, right? What if you can say to him or her, you know, could you go out in the backyard and get me just a sprig of parsley? Yeah. And you maybe have to show him what it is first time, right? Bring it back. And then you go, would you mind just chopping? That parsley. And here's this big, really sharp knife that I've already kind of showed you how to use, but I trust you. You're a big kid now. Thank you very much. It's going in the spaghetti sauce. Go away now. Do your thing. I think just that little bit of engagement. They don't have to cook the whole dinner, but just right. involving them a little bit. Wow. Because they're now taking ownership of the meal, taking ownership of their decision making and what to eat. That's a beautiful thing. Well, I know you don't want to preach, but you're preaching to the choir. I have, a, <laughs> I, no, no. <laughs> I love, I love getting my kids in the kitchen. It's my favorite classroom um, from colors to flavors to textures to counting. Like it allows me to provide a meal for them. And I've seen their one, it's an also another touch point of exposure, not just, hey, I'm plating this in front of you. You don't know what's coming for dinner. Now here it is. You got to eat it. Mm -hmm. Struggle fight my kids get over the hump of trying things so much faster when they're pulling sprigs of cilantro into a colander. And then all of a sudden my two-year-old has it in his mouth. But if it ever was like on his white rice at a Mexican meal or, you know, in his dish, he would probably pick it out. So it's kind of amazing what they're willing to try and be involved in when you give them that autonomy and that independence. Absolutely. So cool. Well, so we'll end today's podcast with some quick fire questions. So, um, Michael, in your day, what's your favorite meal to eat and share with your family? Mm -mm. Absolute favorite meal. Um, I've been making pasta lately and it takes some time and that pasta sauce and so she put the actual, you know, spaghetti noodles themselves. I really love kind of doing, doing that and, listening to the radio, whatever role and when I'm doing it, but that's sort of one of my favorites. Yeah. From scratch. The yeah, pasta scratch, too. Sure. I yeah. love it. You are, you are walking the walk for sure. And when it comes to foods that are kind of always off the table for you and your family foods, you, or a type of food that you wouldn't bring into your house kind of ever, um, do you have one that you steer clear of? Yeah. So I'm not a vegetarian but I 
don't bring industrial meat into the house because I, I feel sorry for the animals. It's not even a nutrition thing because we do eat some some food and we're sort of we're of the minds that we're happy and willing to pay more for better meat and just kind of eat less of it and, and consider it a treat. But but yeah, especially chickens from a big battery chickens from a big chicken you know factory. I, I just I just I, I draw the line at that. Yeah. Well, you, I went to the regenerative farming conference last month and y- you should check out pasture bird hundred mm. percent pasture raised. And well, there, we have like, green markets in New York. So well, there we, you're good. We get, you know, and, and we get old animals, which is fantastic. I mean, they've lived their life, whether it's dairy cows or, or, you know, goats or, and there, I think there's something really wholesome about sort of ending their life in, in a sort of honorable way of, of eating them at the end as opposed to, you know, whatever. 110% short yeah. life. Right. Absolutely. We just lost all the vegetarians in the hey. audience. But <laughs> we have Perfect. a big mix here. Don't you worry right. about a thing. Um, and I think it's very sound advice. So uh, last but not least, what's next for you? Um, I'm actually working on a film. Which is using some satire to Mm -hmm. get at some of these very serious things we've been talking about, because I think they're one of the ways to people's stomachs in their, in their heads and their brains and their hearts is laughter. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, it's kind of a new thing for me being a serious investigative journalist, but (laughs) uh, but I'm, um, I'm working on that right now. That's so exciting. When can we expect it? I don't have a date yet. It's still okay. in the very kind of early stages, but I'll let you know. Yeah. Whenever it goes live, let me know. We'll update the show notes and send it out to our newsletter subscribers. Michael, this was really, really nice to have you on the podcast. And just to share this side of it, I don't want my audience to feel like they're out of control, that they don't have self-discipline, that they should be able to keep these foods around all the time without problem. I don't see big business and these um, large food companies going away or changing anytime soon. And it's mm-hmm. it's on us to make changes in our own house and in our own neighborhood and our own yep. cities. So thank you for sharing this side of it. I highly recommend both your books. I'm going to link them in the show notes. But where can people follow along to learn more about what you're doing and, um, and read I, what you're up to? Yeah, no, thank you so much. I have a little website. I made it myself. It's not much to look at, but it's mossbooks.us. Okay. And I usually post like the newest stuff there, but you can you can see my interview with John Stewart, bless his heart, of the Daily Show way back when, and this and that, and some of the videos I've done. So that would be, and my email is there uh, as well, so people can get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, we'll link everything in the show notes and make sure. Especially, I think the most important for anyone who wants to dive even deeper into today's conversation is to go back and get your books, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, and Hooked, Food, Free Will, and How Food Giants Exploit Our Addictions in 2021. Thank you so much, Michael. It's just a pleasure. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you again for your work.